Welcome to Spooky Ass Shit. I am your host, Eric Dwinnells. And with me tonight, returning once again, for the first time since our trip to Ponyhenge, Brian Tony. Hey guys, Happy New Year. Yeah, that trip took a lot out of me. That's why it took so long to yeah, get back. I think it did. I think it changed you. Drained a lot of my <laughs> sacred energy. Yeah. Pony Henge and the Wayside Inn. Actually, you know what probably drained you. Uh, can't wait for this. The Mary Had a Little Lamb Schoolhouse. <laughs> that did a number as well, That yes. lecture that we attended. Mm-hmm. Accidentally. That lecture is still going on as far as I know. <laughs> that was something. Um, Brian, we're not here today to talk about haunted inns. Okay. Or ponies in a circle. Okay. Or even little lambs. Okay, we're here well, tonight I'm, to talk I'm gonna about. I'm going to go. Well, we're here tonight <laughs> to talk about something that's called the most haunted house in England. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, it's like world's best hamburgers. <laughs> you made us have a sign, most haunted house. Yeah. Come get some. There is a little catch, though. Oh. It's the most haunted house in England, but it doesn't stand anymore. Okay, well, all right. I, listen, I'm just telling you what they say. I have a lot of say. thoughts. All right. It's what they say. This is a place called the the uh, Borley House. Have you heard of it? I have not. Probably because it hasn't been standing since hasn't the 40s. Exi- also, there's not a ton of houses that I'm aware of in England. <laughs> I know it's going to surprise you. Well, there's the palaces. We know those ones. Yep, yep. I know those. Yeah. Is the House of Usher in England? Is that a thing? Or, no, I heard that a, fell. Poe was American, wasn't he? He was. All right, never mind. I got nothing. All right. Well, let me just tell you, uh, this is a, this is a haunted house. There's all kinds of phantasms here. There's a nun that's very popular. Classic. Um, uh, there's a, a phantom coach that you don't see, but you hear come pulling up to the door. Okay. And my favorite one, but they don't say too much about him in the stories, but my favorite one is a headless ghost that hangs out in the bushes. Okay. He just hangs out. Yeah. All right. So he never comes out of the bushes, but they can tell he's headless? I haven't seen any reports of him doing anything. So there's <laughs> so there's two... Actually, there's two sources here that I want to talk about. One is the book that I've had since my childhood. Oh, my Strange God. Strange Stories, Amazing Facts. Oh, I've heard of this book. I love this book. I always have. It's a Reader's Digest collection. Naturally. And it's basically unsolved mysteries in book form. Except it's not all unsolved mysteries, but... Uh, it's all kinds of stories. There's paranormal stories. There's ghost stories. There's um, like stories about eccentric millionaires and Yee. legendary lands and beasts. And there's like chapter headings like that. And then there's all these stories about it. And the Borley House is mentioned in here, along with a, a few pictures. So I should okay. not have uh, closed the book and lost the page because okay. I wanted to show you those pictures. I'll find them though. It's one fifteen. Yeah. yeah. What if it is? I'll stop doing that. Yeah, you are you are uh, messing up the audio. <laughs> Just spooky noises or yeah. clipping. Yeah, too spooky. Uh, all right. So before we get into it, though, of course, I want to remind everyone to check out the website spookyas.com or spookyassshit.com. They both take you to the same place, and that is the show's blog page. From there, you can listen to each and every episode, even the ones no longer available on your favorite streaming service. You can also find links to all of our social media. We are at Spooky Ass Shit on Instagram, and you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash spooky as. While you're there, you can join our closed group, the Spookaroos. I still think it should be the ass shitters. No, I think you're wrong about that. <laughs> okay, agree to disagree. Now, Brian, the the Borley house that we're really going to be talking about in this episode uh, was built in 1863 as basically uh, it was the rectory for a nearby church. Mm-hmm. And a rectory, and I don't know, maybe it works different in different religions. So I was raised Catholic. The rectory is where the priests live. Okay, but I, I would could, believe that. It's just like a word I've heard, never really thought about it. Yeah, I no, that, re- that's what it was here, where the priest, you know, the, sure. we had the church, and then across the street was the rectory. And if you had to talk to the priest off church hours, you had to go to the rectory, ring the doorbell over there. Nice. Yeah, for my Protestants out there, that's the parsonage. Uh-huh. So, uh, this is, these are not Catholics that we're going to be talking about. 
Um, but uh, I do think there's a little anti-Catholicism built into these tales. Interesting. Because, like I said, the main house we're going to be talking about was built in 1863. However, the legends about the land that the house was built on go back much further than that. Okay. And they involve Catholics. All right. And some shady shit that they got up to. So. I mean, that's just not believable. That's why part of my theory on this is that, you know, it's not so much ghost as it is just like anti-Catholic propaganda, Mm -hmm. partly. Yeah, we had that right up until, what, 1974 in this country? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we had we had Kennedy, who was a Catholic. And people but, did not like that. No, that was right. And, I mean, what happened to him? Yeah. I'm not saying they're necessarily related, but who well, knows? Well, that was aliens, we don't know. though. We don't know for sure. Yeah. Aliens, you say? Yeah. I heard Bigfoot was behind the grassy knoll. I mean, there were a lot of parties involved. All right. Bigfoot was just the money, as far as I know. It was a conspiracy <laughs> between yes. cryptids. <laughs> sure he knew too much yeah all right so uh the land that the borley house was built on they according to legend was built as housing originally it's there like is a legit a mon- convent nearby though okay so it's possible that this was for the monks and then the convent was for the nuns makes sense to me yeah so you were going to say something no, I was trying to make a clumsy portmanteau of monastery and convent, but I'm not going to try. No. <laughs> All right. Now, there's a couple uh, of love legends, which I know you're a fan of. <laughs> I love me a good love legend. Yeah. Associated with this land. Is it anti-Catholic? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay, great. Let's go. So, legend number one. There was a Catholic monk living in the land who uh, fell in love with a nun. Yeah, they're not supposed to do that, huh? They are not supposed to do that. Now, other religions, you can be a priest and you can be married and you can have relations and that kind of thing. But in Catholicism, even to this day, last I knew anyway, I haven't been to church in many, many, many years, but last I knew, priests are not allowed to get married. I don't know if they really harp on that in church either. Just remember, if you become a nun, no nucky. Yeah. Just in case you were getting any ideas. But anyway, uh, yeah, definitely not supposed to be having an affair. Uh, Their affair was discovered, however. So the monk, sensibly enough, what they did was they took him out and they hanged him. Sure. On the property. Why not? And the nun was walled up while alive in the basement. Okay, classic. Is this the first, like, version of that story? That's an interesting question. We'll get to it later. Okay. There's a lot of Poe vibes around this. (laughs) But yeah, now even even like back in the day, because like this was, I mean, 1300s was a while ago, I, but it agree. wasn't like the 500s, you know, it wasn't like, oh God, the 500s, dark ages, you know, uh, it's like, I think this seems a little too extreme for the time. The 1300s? I don't think so at all. To hang a dude and then wall somebody up alive? Dude. Because they were having an affair? No, man. This is like, what do we call the Middle Ages? Isn't that like, am I going to expose my ignorance of history? What? Yeah, it would be, that would be like, it might technically still be Middle Ages, be very late. Late Middle Ages? Yeah. I just think like, when was the first printing press? It was like 15 something, right? Don't listen. Let's not, <laughs> I'm just let's saying. not expose both of our <clears throat> limited <laughs> public school education. Be here. sure to comment on social media, <laughs> folks. Yeah, no, but I'm just saying, like, I don't know. It's, it's I totally could believe that. If, you, right. if you said that happened in, like, 15-something, I'd be like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. I mean, things can happen, but this sounds like they're saying, like, it wasn't, like, a like an officially sanctioned thing. They just, like, went and got them. And, like, maybe, but... Who, who are these them, though? Like, the are who's they other it? Catholics? No, like, the people who, like, Yeah, presum- presumably it would be the other monks, right? I That's a big presumption, I think. All right. Well, I guess we'd have to find out a little bit more. But guess what? <laughs> there is we no ain't more. Gonna. <laughs> All right. So that's the first. That's the first legend that these lovers were killed. It's a good one. On the Start side. off good. Uh, fast forward three hundred years. Now we're in the sixteen hundreds. Great. The building, the original building, was torn down, but a manor house now stands on the grounds. It is owned by the wealthy Henry Waldengrave. 
<laughs> I mean, that's a pretty good name. Yeah, not made up at all, right? No. Nope. Good. <laughs> Walden Grave, that's like two different languages that means forest grave. All right, anyway. Yeah. Now, he, like I said, this, this place was near uh, a, uh, a convent, right? Sure, but now so that's a manor, we're like... The manor is just a manor, but the convent, secular. Yeah. The, conv- the convent is still down the way. Okay. So there's this French nun who leaves her French order to join this English order, and she, so she goes to this convent near what will become the Borley House. Heel turn, all right. And while she's there, she keeps crossing paths with this wealthy Henry guy. <laughs> Just by happenstance. And he seduces her. Like you do. <laughs> and the two of them uh, end up getting married. Oh, that's kind of nice. Her name, by the way, I don't know. How would you say this in French? It's Marie. I got that part. You're not L- going to want to hear my French. L A I R R E. Lair? That's as good as I was going to do. Marie Lair? Or Lorraine or something. Lorraine, Lair, one of those. Uh, he, yeah, he seduced her and they ended up getting married. And then... I can't wait for nothing bad to happen. Well, this story isn't as romantic as the other one. <laughs> All right. It's just that one night, Henry, in a fit of rage, turned and strangled Marie. I mean, gross. Also, you paused a little after turned. Uh, like, like turned into a bat. No, I was just <laughs> pausing because the truck was going by. Oh man. Uh, yeah, and also he buried her body in the basement. <laughs> okay. Well, walled it up or buried? Just buried it. All right. So basements are definitely not furnished yeah. in these days. Okay. No, two dead ladies in the basement. Oh boy. So far. Now, in 1863. The place was rebuilt again, and this is when it becomes what would become the Borley House. All right, so we've tried monastery, we've tried manor. What's next? So it's back to being a rectory. Come on, learn. This time it's for a Reverend Henry Dawson Ellis Bull. I mean... And it's not not a Catholic place anymore because this man has a family. Okay. So he's got to be some kind of Protestant... Or I don't know, Church of England, do they let you get married? I, I was the know. Church of England still a going concern in 1863? Yeah. It was? It still is. Is this Anglican? Yeah. All right, guys, uh, don't fact check any of this, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, yes, he moves in with his family. Soon after they move in, his daughters report seeing a ghostly figure of a nun walking through their back garden. Trying to keep it low. The family mentions this to the villagers. <laughs> Great move, guys. Yeah. I don't know. It's like if your reverend came up to you and was like, hey, by the way, my daughter's like, they say they saw a ghostly Catholic nun walking around outside. Okay, cool. Where's the, uh, where's the old hanging gang <laughs> that has survived these 400 years? So, yeah, when he mentions it to the locals, they all say like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's called the nun's walk. <laughs> okay twist i was not expecting that yeah they're like oh yeah no we've all seen her oh, yeah totally she comes out like basically at twilight every night and she just like walks around the garden and sometimes we can see her like in the windows too of the house <laughs> poses for selfies you know <laughs> so so this was like a, a well-known thing and like i said the, they called it the nun's walk so they all knew like yeah we, we go we see this all the time so hearing this the daughters decide they want to be little ghost hunters. They want to try to make contact wow. with the spirit. So the, so the dude's got four daughters, and they go out to the garden one night, and they're like, all right, we are going to talk to the spirit when it comes by. We're going to talk to it. So they see the ghost, and they try to talk to it, but it doesn't answer them. And as they get closer to it, because they're approaching it, the apparition disappears. Okay. I was kind of expecting that version. The other version is like, does something cool that can't be proven. But The family also claims that they often heard bells ringing and phantom voices. They often heard what sounded like a horse-drawn carriage oh, pulling up carriage to the door. Now. All right. 
But well, it was the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. But when they get to the door, there's nobody out there. There's no carriage. There's no horses. No nothing. It's classic poltergeist stuff, right? Yeah. One daughter reports seeing an old man, and another reports being awoken by a spectral slap in the face. <laughs> I mean, that's a prank. <laughs> that's one of the other sisters being like, hey. Okay, so you bring up a good point. And because, yes, these reports um, come from the daughters. Young girls, teenage girls. I don't know the exact age. But this is something that we notice in a lot of ghost stories. It usually starts with the children. And as you said on your own, uh, it usually starts off in kind of like prankish kind of things. Like this isn't like, you know, some serious demonic activity. This is what you might consider like it's it's funny how ghosts seem to do things that children would do. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just coincidence. Just saying. Always. Of course. Just using a little critical thinking. Don't please. By 1892, Henry Bull had passed away. And so his son becomes the new reverend. His name is Harry Bull. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's his name, man. Just one, though. There are not multiple Harry <laughs> Bulls. He becomes the head of the household. All the previously reported specters continue to visit, along with making all their noises and everything. Well, sure. But this is when the headless ghost appears in the bushes outside the house. Okay, so as soon as the transfer of power happens, now there's a headless guy. Yeah. And as I really, reported by him or still... I These reports are very vague. Okay. And the sources that I had, which include the book that I mentioned earlier, Strange Stories, Amazing Facts. Uh, I had that book since I was a kid. It's a Reader's Digest book which is a compilation of short stories that were submitted to this magazine that used to exist maybe still does i don't know reader's digest and uh, i already described that book but the other source is a website and podcast although i didn't hear the bot the podcast because their old episodes are behind a paywall and i wasn't doing that <laughs> um but it was called skeptoid so skeptoid.com interesting um that's where I'm getting most of this information from. I did check out a couple other websites, but they didn't have any different information or more thorough information. Um, there are some books about the case, but I have not read those yet <laughs> and probably won't. Yeah. But if I do, I'll talk about them someday. You got as much Harry Bowl as you, you can take. <laughs> so in the reports that I read, there's not much information on what this headless ghost was or what he wanted or why he would be haunting the place. It's not like the nun. We're like, okay, we know of at least two nuns that are supposed to be dead on the property. There was a cook working at this time who reported that he would lock a door every night only to come in in the morning and find it unlocked. (laughs) There's such classic tropes. It's like such minor things. Uh, listen, no human could have unlocked that door. I I mean, I agree with you. Now, unlike his, his father, who took these things a little bit more seriously, and, and the daughters that were, you know, they were a little bit nervous around the ghost, Harry actually enjoyed the hauntings as a form of entertainment. Okay. Like, he believes that they're all happening, and he enjoys that? Or he enjoys the the reports and speculation well i guess we'd have to ask him but in any event ah shit we can't he built a balcony to overlook the garden so okay that, so that he could go out on the balcony smoke a cigar and watch the nun walk every night oh all right so it sounds like he's he's kind of in it and he would have visitors over and he'd tell them about the ghosts and they'd claim to see things and he'd be like all right write it down we'll put it in the book it was like opium around back, back oh, i'm sure it was in some form all right Yeah, I saw From Hell. <laughs> I'm sorry. Johnny, yeah, yeah. Johnny Depp was all up in it, though. That he was in the 1800s. Definitely was. Okay, so in 1928, or by 1928, Harry Bull had passed away. <laughs> That's terrible. And now a new rector moves in. His name is Guy Smith. Okay. This guy's not real. <laughs> Who's that guy? It's a guy. It's guy Smith? Smith, yeah. Guy Smith. Yeah, he moves in with his family. They heard the bells, 
and the knockings and the footsteps and the voices. His daughter was locked in a room by unseen hands. <laughs> How many daughters did he have? Just the one this time, oh, I think, okay. as far as I know. His wife claimed to have seen the phantom coach, and while cleaning, she discovered a package wrapped in what looked like brown paper. She opened it to discover a human skull. I was going to say the guy's head. <laughs> That's why he was like, hey, I think you, I got something delivered here instead of my new address. <laughs> Reverend Smith called the newspaper the Daily Mirror. And they sent out a paranormal investigator by the name of Harry Price. A lot of Harry's up in this. Now, I, wanna, I don't know for sure. I meant to look this up and I forgot all about it. I believe that the Daily Mirror is what you would call like a tabloid newspaper. It sounds like it. It's not like a... I don't know what, what the equivalent of like the New York Times or something would be in England. But I'm pretty sure the Daily Mirror is like the National Enquirer or something like that. I've, I've actually, I don't want to get into this. <laughs> Delete this part. <laughs> I know I'm going to leave that part. Okay. Explaining <laughs> no, there's why just there's a bunch of stuff that I've read it. on Twitter that's probably disreputable, but. All right, then. But that it, it used to be like, it used to be the paper of record in England or a paper of record in England and has since been turned into a tabloid style dealie in the past couple of decades. But well, that's an interesting be. question then, because I wonder back in the uh, 20s what the reputation of this paper was. Oh. But they're sending out a paranormal investigator, although that may or may not have been what he was called at the time. Official per- yeah, official profession, paranormal investigator. Yeah. Harry Price. Like, who pays that guy? As soon as Harry Price enters the house, there are rocks and a vase being thrown at him. <laughs> okay. Frightened, the Smith family move out after only having lived there for one year. Okay. So... But he's the only one who saw this. Like, a paranormal investigator walks in the room, and he's like, yeah, they're throwing shit. You guys got to get out. Maybe I can again, get a mortgage on it. Again, a little bit unclear in the, uh, in the reports that I have. In 1930, a reverend by the name of Lionel Algeron Foister. Yes. His wife, Mary Ann, and daughter... Adelaide all move in okay at this time we get all the regular reports the knockings the phantom voices the sightings those kind of things all the stuff we've been seeing sure but we have something a little twist added okay what this happened time, to the, what happened to the headless guy I feel like we only he's just him chilling all right I miss him this time messages begin to appear written on the walls. Ooh. The messages were often unintelligible scribble, <laughs> but the name Marianne could clearly be read. And some people who have looked at the writing claim that they can very clearly see the phrases Marianne get help or Marianne light mass prayer. Okay. This is something that is pictured in the book. Nice. So I would like for you now to take a look but I also want to point out when you look at the picture you will see this Uh, I don't know if it was Marianne herself or if somebody else but somebody was attempting to respond to this writing because you would see Marianne scribble 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 or words depending what you see and then you would see someone writing I cannot understand tell me more so I don't know if it's Marianne writing back or what so it's like bathroom graffiti just like (laughs) back and forth after attempting to get this communication and they just get more kind of scribble writing back except for the name Marianne would be written very clearly you can see that in the pictures I'll put them on Instagram Uh, the the foisters attempted to erase or paint over the words on multiple occasions but they would just keep reappearing so here you are take a look it's the picture down towards the bottom what was that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Looks like my cursive. What do you get out of that? But you can, But Marianne it, is it very like clearly a, written. Yes, like almost like very suspiciously clear. Right. 
in like cursive. she was just practicing writing her name on the wall or something. The thing under it looks like it looks like a bunch of stuff like written on top of itself. Like it could be there could be words, but there's like way too many lines. And then Marianne, <laughs> written in what seems like different handwriting, very clearly. It basically just looks like someone learning cursive and doing it super badly. Or like learning forgery or something. But you don't you can't make out any words as you look at that. Eh, the second one's no, not really. Like light light lamp pose. <laughs> no, I got nothing, man. <laughs> Marianne, light the lamp post. <laughs> yeah, like you do. You can this back? You can just close it. We're done with it for now. All right. They also claim that they heard voices calling out Marianne's name. Uh, it's reported that she was thrown from her bed and slapped in the face. Ah, the slapper's back. Slap happy ghost. My goodness. Wake up. Now, the reverend was like, hey, I'm a reverend. I'm going to perform, like, sacred Christian rituals. And get rid of this ghost. Now, we already know he's not Catholic, and Catholics are the ones who specialize in this kind well, of thing. Well, I was going to say, at what at what point in history do religious Christian-adjacent, like, priest, whatever, highest-ranking minister, stop being taught, like, exorcism rites? Do they still get taught that shit today? They do, but it's, like, a specialized thing. It's not, like, not everybody learns it. You have to, like, go to special... <laughs> <laughs> exorcism classes oh my gosh i can't afford them yeah that I could guess. be the case <laughs> yeah it's like scientology they're all like that like you have to pay certain levels to extra get, so. for exorcism yeah. uh so he he so he says you know what i'm gonna try to get rid of the spirit i'm gonna exercise these demons oh girl but it was no help oh. the foisters then said hey wait a minute there was a paranormal investigator in here not too long ago. Let's get him back in here and see what he has to say. So this time, Harry Price was like, look, I've been there before. And when I walk through the door, they throw stones at my head and vases. So what I want you to do is just keep a log of all the different things that are happening to you. And, you know, if you find like significant things, like report them back to me. So Reverend Foister says, OK. And uh, Mr. Price says that Reverend Foister reported over 2,000 separate incidents of contact with paranormal activity in this house. What? Between 1930 and 1935. Oh, okay. Well, that's slightly less shocking than if it was, like, in six months. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, literally taking all his time to... Probably a lot of repeat incidents. There goes the Thursday bell. Yeah. Something like that. So, they move out, the Foisters... And then the house is abandoned, as far as I can tell, for a little while. Except that Harry Price is like, okay, now the place is abandoned. I'm going to rent it out for a little bit. I'm going to do some proper investigation. Sure. But I don't want people accusing me of doing something shady. Mm. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run an ad in the newspaper. The Times this time. Okay. Seeking, quote, people of leisure and intelligence. Who are intrepid, <laughs> critical, and unbiased. All right. Some to, real science heads. To come and stay in the Borley house with him and just report any paranormal occurrences that may occur while they're there. Over 200 people answered his ad, and out of that group, he selected 40. There were men of science. There were Oxford-educated people in the group. Yeah. And then there were some regular Joe Schmoes. What year is this again? Uh, 1937, yes. <clears throat> okay. So he gets this group together, and people agree that they did see strange things in the house. Some people say they saw objects move on their own. They heard unexplained noises. One man claims that he was hit with a bar of soap. <laughs> All right. And one of his scientific people had brought thermometers. And he said that one of his thermometers dipped down 10 degrees in unexpectedly in a matter of seconds. 
Interesting. So there's always these kind of ghost hunters back then. This would have been a network TV special. Yeah, but in this... So in this construct, they pay him to ghost hunt for him. That's what's going on? I don't know if he charged them to do it or if it was just more like a publicity kind of thing. Okay. But with all this paranormal stuff going on, Price is like, all right, time to break out the Ouija board. (laughs) Which was invented when? Oh, it was invented by now, yeah. Okay. I forget. I did a whole episode about it, but it was definitely it was definitely around by now. Oh wow. The official Ouija board. And there were maybe there were maybe kind of spirit talking boards before that, but the official Ouija board had been around for many years. The group made contact with two separate spirits. First, the former nun, Marie. Oh, haven't talked she, to Marie in a while. She spoke up to tell her story. That's why we know that she lived in this house and was murdered by her husband who strangled her and buried her in the basement. Yeah, that's where that information comes from. Just now? Yeah, Okay. the seance thing. Uh, she also states that she is doomed to wander around the house and grounds of Borley until her remains are discovered and given a proper Christian burial. That sucks. That's a pretty regular ghost want and yeah. ask, though, that you know, a proper burial will help them rest. The next spirit who identifies himself as Sonix Amorous, <laughs> he chimes up. To warn the group that he plans to burn the building down that very night. All right. So kind of two extremes here. (laughs) He's got more to say. All right. When he does burn the house down, the next morning when they're sorting through the wreckage, they will find the skeletal remains of a murder victim. Okay. Well, so two birds there. Hmm. So that night, there was no fire. (sighs) <sighs> nuts so he was only renting the place so he's done Mr. Price Yeah. he moves on with his life but about a year later the Borley house is purchased by a man named Captain W.H. Gregson yep <laughs> not a rectory anymore just a straight up house that you can buy <laughs> is he an actual captain or self appointed I'm telling you what the story <laughs> told me while Wee. unpacking he accidentally knocked over an oil lamp, setting the house ablaze. Mm, clumsy ghosts. Now, some townspeople came to, you know, see this house on fire and everything. Because <laughs> there wasn't much to do. Yeah. And they say that in the windows they could see the nun. She's staying in the house while it burns down? I mean, she's a phantom. I guess so. The house was so damaged that it was beyond repair. And so it was torn down. But Harry Price was like, hey, wait, this is perfect. While the house is being torn down, why don't we excavate the basement and see if we can find any of these bones that these ghosts were talking about? So, does he just, like, live down the block when he's not <laughs> living there? He's like, hey, what's going on over there? I got a thought, you guys. What if we... God damn it, Harry. You well, again? Well, that's, that's a very good question, and we're going to come back to that in a okay. little bit. So he says, yeah, you know, I just happened to be down the street. I'm going to come by with some guys. I happen to be down the street. Yeah, I got some gardeners that are going to come and like do the you know digging and everything to yeah. excavate this place. But I'm also going to bring a pathologist just to uh, you know make sure you know if we do find anything, see what it is. So they dig for like maybe an hour or two, and about four feet underground, they claim they find the remains of a young woman. And the pathologist is right there on site yeah. to confirm these are the remains of a young woman. And this is 40s at this point or still yes. 30s? Yes. Okay. 1943. All right. I don't know what the state of pathology was back then. but We're getting we're getting there. So they, they take these bones, figuring that these must be Marie's. Sure. And they give her a proper Christian burial. Was she the first one or the, the second She's one? She's the second one. Oh, okay. So whatever right. happened to the one in the wall, eh. that story doesn't figure in anymore. We heard it, and that was the end of it. Well, yeah, she might have burned up. if she. If she Although if you there. see a phantom nun, maybe it's the woman who was still actually a nun when she died, 
as opposed to the woman who hadn't been a nun for some time before she died. It's possible. So maybe those were two separate phantasms. <laughs> it's hard to keep track, honestly. Now, I think a big question that we should be asking in all of this is who the fuck is Harry Price? Uh, I'd like to know. Now, he's the this paranormal investigator, but who's he really? Why is he always there? The questions you were just pondering. Well, it turns out that uh, he was not some kind of like science guy like you might no. hope. <laughs> you sure? He was actually a professional magician. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. And he was also known to be something of a con man. You don't say? I do say. All right. He had staged ghost photos <laughs> where he's like sitting chill and then there's like a ghost over his shoulders. Going to try to find some of those. Put those on Instagram as well. That's Larry. Uh, he also went on tour with many fake items, including a fake statue of Hercules claiming to be from olden times. Oh, so just, okay. Counterfeit. Yep. Uh, um, fake Roman treasure. Yeah. And uh, he also had a bone that was carved with hieroglyphs that he said came, you know, from ancient Egypt. Yep. It did not, and it was not. Well, I'm just downright disappointed in this guy. Now, why would he do this? Uh, well, he did get notoriety, of course. He was in several newspapers with the story. He also wrote three books on the subject, including one called England's Most Haunted House. Yeah, okay. And so that's where this title comes from. Uh, however, it is important to note that before 1929, when he came to do his first investigation, there are no written documented paranormal activities in this house we have the legends from the bull family saying that they heard things but there's no written documentation that that ever happened that they ever said these things it's just when this guy comes along well that's interesting and writes these starts so he just found a house he was like let's set up shop baby but he probably would not have heard those musings from decades and decades prior or is it possible he might have it's possible, or he could have just made them up. Fair enough. No, 300 years ago. No, that guy didn't say that. <laughs> Here's what really happened. Yeah. I'm Harry. Nice yeah. to meet you. Um, also, his reports contradict what the families actually say. For example, the Smiths, those are the ones that they only lived there for a year. Guy Smith yeah. and his, his family, uh, they only lived there for a year. The, they're the ones that called the paper initially to report these strange things. They say, um, no, we, we moved out because the building was crumbling and it had prehistoric plumbing. Checks out. Mrs. Smith says that she did, in fact, find a skull in the garden. <laughs> but it was not wrapped in brown paper? Uh, no, but it was believed to have belonged to a victim of the plague. And the area where they were lived, Yee. where they lived, was known to be like an area where plague victims had been buried. And it wasn't uncommon to find bones out in your back garden at that time. Okay, that's another reason to move out. I know. I was. She said that, and they said it like as like a thing to prove that there were no ghosts. I'm like, I don't. That actually, <laughs> no. Like, I yeah, know I'm a skeptic and everything, but that like doesn't make it less likely to be haunted. No, you don't understand. <laughs> There's tons of dead bodies in her backyard. <laughs> that's it's like a common thing. Yeah. Like. <laughs> You're yeah. weird. You're the weird one. Uh, now, Marianne Foister, she's the one who's getting the messages written on the wall. Sure. And the only one who's getting these kind of things. She herself said, this isn't spirits. This is uh, pranks being pulled on me by my husband and Mr. Pierce working together. Anything to keep busy, I guess. Yeah. And Pierce, they, they gave this uh, theory to Pierce and he said, oh, no, she's wrong. Um, but you know who's probably doing it is she is. <laughs> it sounds healthy. Either she's doing it like purposely to make a hoax or... Like, her spiritual energy is such that she's doing it and doesn't even know she's doing it. Like, a poltergeist kind of thing. Like, kind of a carry situation where she's doing it with her mind uncontrollably. Writing her own name. Yeah. That's that's a pretty weird sleeper cell power to have. Now, the writing on the walls is an interesting point. Because in d different reports that I've read, they've 
put it different ways. Some reports say, most of the reports say that the writing was actually on the wall, but other reports say that the writing was not on the wall, it was on scraps of wallpaper. And the reason they used wallpaper was because it just happened to be the handiest paper they, they had. had. Yeah. Like it was long sheets, so you could write messages, and that's what was there. Also, the way the writing appeared is described differently. Some stories make it sound like this writing just appeared on the wall. But other people, other sources refer to it as automatic writing. Automatic writing is something different. Are you familiar with this term? I am absolutely not. Automatic writing is like if I was sitting here and scribbling on this page. Yeah. And then I look down and it said, Brian, Tony, I don't know, something, insert joke. Um <laughs> <laughs> that would be odd. <laughs> All work and no play. Yeah. Something no, like but like if I just sat down and like started making scribbles and yeah. then it said words and then like so the idea is that either it's coming from my self-conscious or from a spiritual realm or there's a ghost guiding my hand or there's a ghost possessing me or a spirit possessing me or some other dimension tapping through. That's automatic writing. Okay. So to me, it's even less impressive if they're literally just sitting there with some wallpaper scribbling on it and then someone says like oh it says marianne so i'm practicing candle. my like, name what the <laughs> hell yeah so again i don't know definitively but it sounds more likely that it was automatic writing on a, on the wallpaper not the actual wall but also like you live in a house with someone there's clearly nothing to do like you don't look over and be like uh hey what the fuck are you doing <laughs> like what are you what you're writing Oh, nothing. My name is some scribbles. Like, I don't know. Maybe he was at work or something. <laughs> now, well, let's talk about this fire. I would love to. Because, you know, Captain Gregson said he knocked over a lamp while he was unpacking. He had just moved into the house. Not sure. long after this, uh, Harry Price had done his seance and everything. He just moved into the house. He knocked over his lamp. Af it was just about a little less than a year after the spirit, Sunix, Said he was going to burn down the house. Uh, still can't get over that name. Yeah. Uh, so it was right after he said he was going to burn. Not right after. It was 11 months after he said he was going to burn down the house. And then the house did burn down. And they did find human remains. Now, aside from the fact that it took almost a year to happen, that sounds like a pretty accurate statement made by Sonex, the spirit from the Ouija board. <laughs> sure. Sure it does. There's a little catch, though. I I'm so it's surprised. It's kind of circumstantial, but let's just follow the trail. First of all, when the house caught on fire, Captain Gregson had to call in the insurance agency and say, hey, it was an accident. The house caught on fire. Give me my insurance money. Yep. The insurance came and did their investigation. And they said, this fire was arson. <laughs> you started this fire on purpose. You dick. So that you could get the insurance money, and that's why you didn't even bother to move your things in. And that's why it happened accidentally the very night you were about to start moving in. The whole house caught on fire. Also, he's the one who had just purchased and gave permission to Mr. Pierce to come and do the excavation, excavation in the what would be the uh, basement. Yeah. Before this. Nothing suspicious at all. Let's uh -huh. just move on. Sorry, I said that wrong. I mean, so he's also the one who gave Mr. Pierce permission to come and do the excavation right after this fire took place. Yeah. And wasn't it coincidental that uh, the gardeners, who were the ones that actually did the digging, don't remember finding any human remains? They said, oh, we found, like, a pig's jawbone. <laughs> was, this, was there hieroglyphics on it? No. Not too bad. But that's the only bone they report finding. Well, they weren't actually digging. They were, like, doing automatic digging. They were just, like, <laughs> standing around, and by, by the time it was done, they had gotten down four feet. And there were uh, previous groups, because we said that the house had been built and rebuilt several times, right? Yeah. So there have been previous crews in there. Nobody had ever found human remains in this basement area. You would hope not. And yet, when Pierce and his gang come, they find remains like within an hour or two, four feet underground, in the exact spot that 
the house had been built over two or three times. Yep. I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're getting at. And All checks just, out for me. He just so happened to have a pathologist and his lawyer on hand when the bones were discovered. Yeah, it's Jerry. Jerry the pathologist. <laughs> They're buds. That really is the end of the story because after this, of course, the house was gone. I don't know what stands on the grounds now, if there's a house or not. I didn't find <laughs> anything, um, but I didn't look too hard either. So it's a Wendy's. I did light research. <laughs> That's fair enough. Inspired by the book from my childhood, Strange Stories, Amazing Facts. I'll take it. I mean, you kind of got to respect the long con. Like, he was doing shit with this house for like, what, over 20 years? Yeah, about just 20 to, years, yeah. Just to get notoriety and, like, write books about it. It's I like, bet he right. had some other hustles going, oh, too, I'm at sure, the same time. But, you, know, but. you could argue he actually did work for the notoriety in a, a kind of roundabout way. He sounds like a, like an early days of Warren, like the Warrens, you know? He sounds like the, the, the ones that all the Conjuring movies, you know, based on the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren. I have not seen a Conjuring. Oh. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I am I am aware of some of the cultural, the Amityville subtext, horror. Though. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, there's they got their hand in. If basically, if it was paranormal in the past fifty years in America, they oh have, okay, they, they so have like, their hand in it somewhere. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I imagine they've made a pretty penny. Yeah, they did back in the day. They're both dead now, but okay. Yeah. Or are they? <laughs> they have a museum. We should go to. <laughs> it's like in Connecticut or something, so it'd be a day trip. But all right, we could do it. They built a museum. Yeah, of so like it's all run of by their... their son now. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. The Annabelle cool. doll is in there, the real one. That doesn't mean anything to me. Sorry. <laughs> There's these movies called Annabelle about a killer doll. Oh, I, I think I kind of remember that. Yeah, a <laughs> killer doll. Yeah, Chucky gonna sue someone. Yeah. All right, Brian. That's really all I have to say about the Borley House, the most haunted house in England. Okay, what were we not going to get to the the story of the person like bricked up behind a thing? I told you, that's all we hear about it. Oh, okay, never oh, mind. What, what, oh, so uh, there the is one thing that I forgot of, to mention. Yeah. Yes, okay, you're right. Um, I'm not sure where this came from, but the reports are that that story may have been planted in the family's head because um, Reverend Bull, the first person who lived in this place um since you know the whole catholic monk house thing uh he had a book of stories that included a story about a woman being walled up uh, and he used to read these stories to his children at night that's what the legend says (laughs) now go to sleep (laughs) no but yeah that's classic trope like there's tons of that in even recent so no it's not the first one and it's been reported that the family was aware of other stories involving that. All right. Well, it doesn't take much, I guess. Hmm. If you're alive in the whatever hundreds and you got nothing to do, a little light haunting might be kind of fun. I mean, look, the apartment that we sit in right now is very old. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, is haunted. I know uh, you've been I here. Mean, I do hear strange knocking sounds sometimes from these walls. <laughs> yeah. I usually just assume it's like a mouse or something. But who knows? Maybe it is haunted. I got a Ouija board. I've got at least two Ouija boards in this apartment. <laughs> Don't they cancel each other out? Then? Maybe. <laughs> All right. You heard it here, folks. Eric's apartment may be haunted. Yeah. We mm. didn't make any... When I did my Ouija board episode, we did try to make contact. Yeah. Tom and I. <laughs> yeah. Didn't, didn't, didn't go didn't great? Work. No. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. All right, Brian. Well, thank you for being here. I'm going to wrap this welcome. up now. Reminding everyone, of course, check out the website again, SpookyAS.com, SpookyAssShit.com. Find us on Instagram at SpookyAssShit and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash SpookyAS. On the website, you can also go to the store. You can get yourself some Spookaroo swag. Excellent. Everybody looks very fashionable in their (laughs) t-shirts. I should hope so. And their uh, tote bags. I've seen some of those. Yeah. IRL. All with people I know, but, you know, still. <laughs> Proves they exist and yeah. your, your stream works. Yeah. And uh, please, if you could, last year, Brian, mm. I only got one lonely review on iTunes. Aww. It wasn't a great year for the show. 
But I'm hoping now that we're in the future, <laughs> now that we're in the show's second decade. Oh, wow. People will say, you know what? I've been listening for years and I've never written a review here. I don't just mean leaving a five star review, which is wonderful in and of itself. That's great. But to take the time to actually write a review and give some encouragement to your boys. That's just a, a blessing beyond compare. Mm hmm. So get on it, folks. It's the new year. Resolve to make more iTunes reviews. I know I have. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Spookaroos. And until next time.